Welcome to Tulsa Music Stream. This is episode 56. Six, 56. 56. And um, if you guys uh, could, would you please share this on your favorite pages, all of your favorite um, groups and all that good stuff. But uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can um, hit subscribe and all that good stuff. We're also live on Twitter and Twitch and all that good stuff. So um, today we are going to be interviewing Mr. Jeff Pilsen from Foreigner. Yes, and indeed. formerly of Dokken. He is the uh, guitar based producer hero of all of our lives right here. Absolutely. He, he does wow. so many things. I don't know how we're going to unpack it all tonight, but we're going to do our, <laughs> our best to do that. Jeff's already here. I'm going to go ahead and bring him on screen real quick. There he is. Good evening, Jeff. Well, how are I you? Am. Hello. I'm how great, you doing? guys. Thank you for having me. This is great. Man, thank you so much. We do want to give a quick shout out. Uh, and much appreciation to Matt Lemieux, who is a mutual friend of ours, and he helped set this up uh, did, and Matt. put us in touch with you. And we'll be talking more about Matt at the end of the show. But like I said, we've got a ton to to unpack with you in a short amount of time. We're going to do our best to get to all the good stuff. And uh, I think our best place to start would be with some of the breaking news, the latest breaking news from the Foreigner Camp. Let me put this up on the screen can you see this, Jeff? This is this is the best of Foreigner Four Live that has just been released, the Las Vegas edition, yeah. and uh, the nice. the yeah. The post says now available exclusively for retail at Walmart. So why don't My you? Yeah, okay. I see that. Hey, hey, check it out. Oh, you know what? We got check it out. We, I got I got Budweiser Zero, dude. Oh wow, how is that? I love it. <laughs> really? Have you tried the Heineken? Yes, yes, I have, but it's a little bit uh, too. Ah, oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, it's skunky. Skunky. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a little like that. I hear you. Anyways, but back to butt. Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> right um, on. So the question was. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The, the, well, we're going to talk about this uh, Best of Foreign or Four Live that just came out. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the making of this? And, of course, there's a lot of hits on there. Tell us about the making of it and what fans can expect when they pick this up at Walmart and check it out. Well, a lot of it was recorded at a show that we did in 2014 at the Borgata in Atlantic City. And it was a live show where we were featuring Foreigner Four um, <clears throat> because it was at the time that was, uh, it was belated, but it was it was to celebrate the 40th anniversary. So um, we're very, very excited about that, or, thir or 30th anniversary maybe. I forget which one. Anyways, bad with numbers now, um, but <laughs> uh the songs were great we got such a tremendous reaction about that um so many people love those versions and we don't often do those songs we did do them uh in vegas which was great it was part of our residency there um so so i think everyone just felt that it would be a good time to put those songs on a disc so you could hear them and if you'd been to the vegas shows you you knew the songs were were around but you may not get a chance to hear them again for a while so it's a great opportunity for that and what's so cool also uh, with the Vegas, uh, you guys also raised money um, for the Ukraine, Ukraine relief relief fund or like $100,000 or something like that. Over 100000 bucks. Yeah, I'm very proud very of that. Cool. Very cool. You know, it, was, it, was a, it was amazing. Like we had this interview set up and then bam, like all this foreigner like news to start breaking. And yeah. we're like, we already had like a bunch of questions and we're like, oh, we got to add this one. And, oh, here's <laughs> hey. another one. Super cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's got to feel good to, to, you know, do work like that that makes a lasting difference in the world. We certainly appreciate you guys uh, doing that. Like Scott said, uh, that goes to the American Red Cross on the behalf of the Ukraine Relief Fund. And uh, props to you guys for doing that. That's Thank super, you. super cool. We're, we're definitely going to talk more about foreigner stuff. I want to quickly uh, swing over because this has to be something else you're also excited about. Let's put this up on the screen. You guys have the Black Swan Generation Mind album coming out on August 4th on Frontiers. And uh, uh, I thought it was April, April 8th. I thought it was oh, out already. You know what? I apologize. They've, that's where they've got the month and the and the uh, day reversed. My uh, bad. Okay. Well, okay. So tell us tell us about that album and what fans of Black Swan can expect when they check that out. All right. Well, um, Black Swan is a band with. Reb Beach uh, from White Snake and Winger on guitar, um, Robin McCauley from the McCauley Shanker Group, Raining the Rock Vault, mm -hmm. all sorts of, uh, I mean, all sorts of other things. Robin is just brilliant, great singer. 
and then Matt Starr is playing drums and myself bass. Um, the record, uh, I'm just really proud of the record. It's very much melodic rock in the style of, you know, Doc and Winger, White Snake, all that kind of stuff. It's very much in that style. Um, but we just really concentrate on the songs. And when you got a voice like Robbins and guitar playing like, like Rebs, and then a rhythm, rhythm section like Matt and I, I, I just don't think you can go wrong. So it's, it's gotten amazing reviews. Um, we got, we did, we put out a record that came out in 2020, our first record called Shake the World. And the response was great on that. And if anything, I'm getting a response from this new record that it's even stronger. So that was what we set out to do. And I just couldn't be more excited about it. So yeah, pick up the new gen, uh, Generation Mind, the new Black Swan record. Definitely will. And it doesn't really suck being in like numerous super groups, does it? I mean, gosh, you must just be, to get to play with the cream of the crop talent out there repeatedly. Do you ever just pinch yourself and go, man, I'm kind of spoiled. You know, I mean, you're, you're obviously one of the top yourself, but to get to play with all these just high level guys that are still at the top of their game, that's got to just feel great. It, it does. It is one of the beautiful advantages of this era where you know unfortunately records don't sell like what they once did sure so it's very hard for a band to just record and just tour i'm mean, some do um but in in like in foreigners case we don't record as often as i personally like to record right so um i i get these outside projects and because so many of us are in the same boat i get to work with these great people like reb and robin and matt and george lynch and just all these people I mean, I've I've got, I've gotten to produce so many wonderful records. Warrant, you know, Stephen Adler. I mean, uh, so much the great list. stuff. Last in line. I mean, so many great people. So so yeah, I I I I kind of do pinch myself all the time because I get to work with these people. Um, and again, you know, in in from our perspective, you know, we wish records sold more, of course. Yeah, sure. Um, but if they're not going to sell. At least we get to play with these great people and we get to collaborate on these wonderful projects. And so, yeah, I'm very grateful for that. And you get to do what you love. And that's kind of probably yeah. first and foremost. I'm curious, yeah. though, was, was there ever a moment because you had a you had a hand in the formation of a lot of those bands. But was there a moment like you're in Foreigner for a while and you and you just went because you're not that much older than us, I'm sure. So, you know, was there ever a moment going, wow, I'm in foreigner i used to hear this band the 70s hits on the radio and i'm i'm a foreigner that's kind of a trip was there was there ever that moment for you well i mean you know because it happened gradually probably not a moment but um many times i have reflected on how grateful i am to be here in foreigner i do love the music i mean i thought foreigner records were amazing i loved lou's voice i loved mixed guitar playing and songwriting i i was a foreigner fan so from that aspect um, I do uh, frequently reflect on how fortunate I am to be in this position and and just the experiences I've gotten through Foreigner have just been mind-numbingly wonderful. So, yeah, I, I have my own version of that. Well, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, the old school Foreigner, I guess Al, Al Greenwood came out in the news and was talking about, you know, how disappointing that Foreigner's not in the Rock Hall of Fame yet. Um, do you have an opinion about that yourself? I'm sure it's biased. Well, <laughs> I don't spend a lot of energy on it because um, there's nothing I can do about it. Right. Um, uh, but my my personal view is I think Foreigner should be in there. My God, 70 plus million records sold. Well, if you look at some I, of the people that are in there too, I mean, holy crap. I mean, come on. Well, I mean, not. I don't even want to do a whataboutism type, type deal um, because my feeling is, you know, part of the rock and roll hall of fame is how much of an influence you had. And I know for bands like Dokken and rat and all sorts of things, foreigner was a huge influence, huge influence. Um, I know even bands like kiss were influenced by that kind of thing. Um, even though kiss came out before that, but you know, they listened to foreigner hits. Um, they, they understood that, you know, wow, you can take rock and you can make it, it can be a big hit song, but it can still be a rock song. And that's the thing about foreigner that I think really, really set made their mark when they came out so yeah. um so my feeling is certainly foreigner deserves to be in there i probably wouldn't go in but that that doesn't even matter to me i mean sure i'd love to be in a rock and roll hall of fame but not that much i mean it's not that big a deal to me so right. i would it would be more important for me to see i would rather see al in 
to be honest with you, because Al deserves it. Sure. <laughs> you, know? you know, speaking of uh, Kiss and Foreigner, I bet Gene would love to have written Hot Blooded. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I think, well, listen, those guys respect songwriting. I know that for a fact, and I'm I'm sure that they have a lot of respect for for Mick songwriting, Mick and Lou. Yeah. So educate us on something. We were looking at your bio and, and studying about you. So your title with Foreigner is actually musical director. Can you kind of educate the masses on, I mean, that sounds like that encompasses a lot of different responsibilities. You're, you don't just show up with your bass and rock out. What, what all no. do you do to keep the Foreigner machine running? Well, I mean, it, number one, it's a very easy job because all the band members are so great. So it's not like I, I'm doing anything miraculous. Believe me, um, but basically, you know, I run the rehearsals. Uh, I design the set lists. I kind of make sure um, that everything is up to snuff. You know, as far as you know, make sure we're sounding right on all the parts and the vocals are right and this, that, and the other thing. All the musical parts. That I kind of help coordinate some of the technical stuff when that goes on, because there's a lot of technical stuff that happens. And when we record like live records and everything, which I actually, they, they credit me as producing as well. Mm -hmm. That's when there's a lot of work involved. Um, but it's basically just running the music, making sure that the music, you know, I'm directing the music and making sure that the music sounds right. Sure. Um, and, and it's a big job, but again, I mean, I've got great songs to work with and a great band. So it's, you know, kind of cheating. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and with Mick in and out on certain shows or festivals or what have you does that does that kind of put a, a you know a wrench in some of your in some of your thoughts and programs and stuff that you are scheduling for uh for the foreigner tour and things like that not really i mean we we kind of do the same when mix there as when mix not there i mean mm -hmm. you know we don't we don't ever want to well mix not here so we can fuck off you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know right. i mean we don't do that so um no, I mean, it, I know I do when my boss isn't yeah. around, you know. <laughs> um, but no, um, no, listen, we all, we all, that's one thing. That's how you get in the band is that you're, you're really serious and you're really dedicated and, and everybody knows you're not going to backpedal or you're not going to do half-ass work just because Mick's not there. Um, sure. Sure. So listen, I mean, it really, it makes, it, it affects us less than you might think. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, okay, so we've talked about Foreigner. Now, now I'm going to I'm going to read a list of band names and I just I want to kind of get an idea of like some memories that when, when I read these band names to you, what kind of memories come up in your mind? Spiders, Christmas, Merrymakers, Mahogany, Cinema. What was that era of your life like as you're trying to break out there as an artist? Spiders, I was six years old, so. <laughs> oh, well, okay, well, but okay, that's a good place to start. So you knew from a very early age you wanted to do this. Actually, that was more in the I was enthralled with the Beatles era. Gotcha. And um, I, you know, I mean, I don't think we ever made it past air guitar or, or maybe, oh, no, actually, I think I, I think I remember having a fake, like a, Tinker Toys and Coffee Can Drum Kit, but um, anyway, um, but no, that was that was strictly. Although I did sing back then, I, I used to sing Beatles songs. That's that wow. was that was you know I was really taken with that. So um, so uh, but the Spiders wasn't a real band. Obviously, it was a kid thing with me and a couple of friends. Um, gotcha. Mahogany was was when I was in junior high, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just those are just the form the bands you form when you're a kid and you're you're starting off and you you're just starting the journey. Sure. But but you're you're like a lot of others. You knew from an early age this was going to be what you were going to do. And yeah. and it, is it true that that uh, Randy Hansen led you to the tryout for Dokken? Was he your connection there? No, he wasn't. It was a guy by the name of Mike Varney. Mike oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That I meant Mike Varney. Yep. Yeah, yes. Well, Mike Varney, yes. Mike Varney absolutely did. Mike and I had been in a band together in San Francisco, and I had just moved to L.A. Um, and um, Mike was kind of the guy you'd call back then. He had a column and guitar player, and he was just really well known as knowing musicians and connecting musicians. And Don Dawkins called him, and you know, because Juan Carusier had been in uh, Dawkins and, and left to join Rat, so... He called Mike and asked, do you, have, do you know of any singing bass players? And my name came up and there you go. Wow. Now you see for me, I'm, I'm a bass player. And so I was telling them for me, and you just mentioned it, him and you, Juan, 
um, you guys like you are the kind of guys I like because I always consider I like to sing and I was a bass player and you guys put on a good show so so um, you guys were that kind of that was an, that was an influence um, for me as a, as a young teen starting out playing bass so thank you for that yeah a lot of energy you're more than welcome and thank you for for saying that Very absolutely nice. So I, I think, uh, and Scott, you get the next one because I don't mean to dominate the mic here. I, I, I do want to ask you about this. I, I was told that you weren't afraid of tough questions. This might be a, t- a little bit tough, but, <laughs> but uh, we all, it's no secret, the, the tension that existed in the Dokken camp and that, you know, that is not a surprise to anyone. I'd like to know if, were you the guy, were you kind of the peacemaker that tried to sort of resolve things? Or was it just a deal where it was kind of every man for himself, let those guys duke it out, I want no part of it, I'm just you know, here to, to rock and have a good time? I mean, what was that like for you? Well, I, I was unfortunately frequently put in the middleman position. Um, I mean, you know, it's never as simple as, you know, if you read about something in the press, it's generally never quite as simple as it's made out to seem. But but there was, there was some truth to that. Um, I would. I was the sh- shuttle diplomat. You know, I would. I would write with George, and I would write with Don. Um, and sometimes that meant, you know, like taking a song to Don that George and I had written the music for, and seeing if Don wanted to put a- vocals on it. Sometimes it meant taking him a song that we had, that George and I had put vocals and uh, lyrics and melodies to, and showing it to Don and seeing how much of it he wants to change or whatever. Um, so yeah, there was there was that. No, I never said, uh, leave me out of this uh, because I kind of all I did recognize early on that um, if the band wasn't if we didn't develop communication, we were destined to fail. Um, Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we did end up, you know, breaking up because of bad communication. But Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, we we survived for a few years there, and I don't want to say I I certainly wouldn't take all the credit for it. I'm just saying, but I think that that was one of the attitudes that helped is trying to make the best of the situation, trying to focus our energy so that we were working towards the same goal rather than two different goals, sure. uh, which frequently happened. Um, the tension was real, but the tension went all the way around, and. Um, uh, although George and Mick and I did tend to gravitate together. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we'd, we'd play together and we'd, you know, we'd jam together and, you know, there, there was a certain camaraderie that Don probably wasn't a part of, and he probably felt left out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was also, I had a camaraderie with Don that, that kind of transcended other aspects of the band. I mean, especially during the dysfunctional period when we were first, uh, starting the reunion period, um, Don and I got very close and and did a lot of great work together. Um, so it's a complicated relationship, but um, but basically, in a nutshell, egos and greed got in the way, just like yeah. they did with everybody else. So once you remove yourself from what was probably considered a toxic environment and you got into something healthier, did the toxicity exist for so long that it almost just became normal? So then when you got in an actual normal situation, that felt weird to you? Well, uh, I wouldn't say normal felt weird to me, but it was it it was so prevalent that toxic feeling that you just sort of i just in my mind i think i just associated you know okay i'm with the docking guys there's going to be that dark cloud over it 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 always kind of had that feeling um although although let me tell you also there was also tremendous moments of humor and fun and uh and positive collaboration that never gets talked about of course but there was a lot of that there really was you know if, if i try and think rationally about that period of time there was a dark cloud hanging over it all the time but then there could be some wonderful moments i mean we did have we all did have a great sense of humor and we knew how to bounce off of each other with that um and there's a there's a love deep down in there you know that was that was part of it that was you know you can't help it you know when you spend that much time and you're that close to people um so it was never as bad as it was made out to be but it was also there was also a lot of real good yeah 
Well, you guys were definitely one of my favorites. I'm going to hand it off to Scott. Well, yes. Uh, I mean, speaking of like positive you know, experience and things, I know like you talked about your 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 reunion, and, you, and there was a couple of them. And one, this one's not quite a reunion, but I guess sort of when you guys went and played in Japan, and you guys put oh, out um, what is it, the uh, Return to the East? Yes. And you put out a, a new video, and it looks like you guys were having fun, and and you know, the beginning of the video and you guys are just kind of, you know, taking, taking photo shots and stuff or promo, promo shoot. And, uh, tell me a little bit about that reunion and, um, what, what did you get out of that? Well, you know, what's funny is the reunion actually was really fun. Um, I don't think we were as well rehearsed and as strong a band as we could have been, uh, going through that, but I would rather be poorly rehearsed and have a, a, a good vibe together than, than the opposite. So sure. it was actually a lot of fun. And we did have a lot of fun making that video. And that song was one of the more painless docking songs that ever came across, which is why, you know, if we ever did do something, I have faith that, okay, we still got it. You know, sure. um, that chemistry is still there. Cause it was, it was actually very painless. The musical side of that song was very, very painless. That's great. So, um, yeah, you know, there's 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 good experiences to be had. What do you what what do you consider Dawkins greatest piece of work? I guess album well, wise, I guess I'm asking. Uh, in some ways under lock and key, but in many ways tooth and nail, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of I kind of go back and there's they're, they're they're kind of almost polar opposites. Oh, right, right, right. I got them here in some here, ways. So. Um but but I I love the rawness of tooth and nail and I love and for me personally, that was a period of real collaboration. And we really, we really did forge, you know, our, our sound <laughs> in that period. And that was very, very cool. Yes. Underlocking E, I think, um, probably our most um, commercial record, I guess. And mm -hmm. there's some definitely really strong songs that I'm still very, very proud of on that, song, on yes. that record. Tell me how much um, you love the outfits on the cover. That's the part I don't love. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that, actually. I knew that. Oh, man. These right here are my original copies from 1980, probably five and 86. Beautiful. So you came to Tulsa with Doc in, in 85 and you, and you had an opener, a local opener, and you came back on the permanent vacation tour with Aerosmith. Yep. So uh, good times, good good teenage memories for me. You know, I always, I always thought that Alone Again came out a little premature because it seemed like the year after 1985 when Home Sweet Home you know, was blowing up on MTV and, and you guys were blowing up on MTV at the same time, but the power ballads just, you know, I feel like you guys were the first, they always credit Motley Crue of home sweet home being the first, you know, power ballad. And then everyone started doing that after, but man, if alone again came out in 85 with all of that, better I mean, production, a little better production. Absolutely. I just, you know, I always felt like that was kind of a premature release. Uh, yeah. release. Although it could be you know, very well right, <laughs> you know, the song you guys had of of course in what eighty five should have been huge too, you know. The, but you were going up against so much on MTV, but it was always climbing, and um, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's amazing how well, some of those your peers in in that time just made it to the statusphere, and then you guys kind of just kind of made. You know, funny is I always thought on 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 the Underlock and Key record. You know, we went with The Hunter as the first single. Mm -hmm. Right. And I always thought that that was a mistake. I always mm. thought It's Not Love should have been the first mistake because it was a big old anthem. Right. Um, and then come out within my dreams and boom, you're, you know, you're home free. Uh, but no, man management was very, very keen on putting out Hunter first. And I, I again, I, I've always thought that that was a bit of a mistake. Unchain the night. Man. Yeah. Unchain the night. Oh, yeah. You know, what do you think about the the party doing the cover of In My Dreams? Did you, did you ever hear that? Sure. Um, I think it was great. You know, I mean, why not? It's pretty wild Especially having someone come. Especially cash after that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. It reminds me of when I was listening to uh, MTV, I don't know, years ago, and Mariah Carey came on and she was doing Bringing On the Heartbreak, you know, mm -hmm. Def Leppard. Yeah. She was? Yeah. Yeah, right, it's, yeah you yeah. ought to check it out. It's pretty wild. You know, I'm a few years younger than they are, and I'm, I, I just was telling Nine this story. 
I became a huge Dawkin fan after I was probably 16, 17. I was listening to Metal Shop and they played a, a cut from Beast from the East. And man, oh. I it just it just snagged me. And I had the cassette and I played it front to back so much that it started to eventually squeal. I just wore it out. I want <laughs> this leads me to my next question. The reason I have jeffpilsonmusic.com referenced on the screen is because I feel like it's a really in-depth uh, dig into your career. Not only do you have just an incredible list of bands that you have performed and recorded with, but your production credits are equally impressive and very substantial. So here's my question. I've always wondered this about, about Beasts from the East. Now, undoubtedly, when a band releases a live album, they go back in and do overdubs to kind of clean it up and polish it up and, and make it sound really good. Was that album highly overdubbed because i'm telling you it's it's there's something about it, it's just magical to me it's probably my favorite release you he guys will never did. tell and i told no, her it's all 100 live yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> all live yeah. albums are are, are are fixed no listen i know that but i want to know to what extent are we talking like kiss alive major or? major overdubs or just a little bit of cleanup here and there well Honestly, it was pretty major. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I mean, to some extent. Um, the funny thing is, is somewhere I have dat tapes of the actual board tapes of those performances. Wow. wow. And you know what? There are mistakes on them, and there's some, you know, out of tune singing here and there and all that kind of thing. Um, but the energy is... yes. So much better. That's the one thing about Beast from the East that bummed me out is I felt like the energy got lost. It actually is a great sounding record. I mean, Michael Michael Wagner mixed it. I was the only band member that was present for mixes on that. Okay. Um, it does sound great, but um, I would someday I'd like to put out these these little board tapes because they're they're Please really. Do. I'm They're begging really you to do that because see, I'm sitting here going, "Holy crap! Your tapes have more energy than that album does." Because I remember I'd crank it, and uh, and George is why I started playing the guitar. I just found it magical. I mean, I think you guys were at the top of your game in that era. Would you agree? We we, we were absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Don was singing great at that absolutely. point. Absolutely, absolutely. Which yeah. and that's and that's that's my next point too. It's he, him, and Paul Stanley are falling into that category of man. It's it's tough to listen to now. It's it's tough, and it's tough to hear guys that you 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 looked up to and that were part of your teenage years sounding like that. It bums me out. I hate it. You know what I mean? And 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 what's your thought on that? How I, I you just, well, I, listen. I mean, to be fair, nobody can. No, I mean, not all vocalists keep their range for. I mean, you know, you don't have a lot of Glenn Hughes's and Ronnie Dio's out mm-hmm. there. And, in the world who whose voices seem to just never never get affected right. um so you know and you know I, I can't sing like i could 35 years ago um uh so you know i got to keep that in mind um with that uh i just you know i i hope don takes care of himself and i hope he can keep singing for as long as possible and i hope i hope he has a little bit of a breakthrough and, and i know he's had a lot of health issues and sure. he's had it's just a lot of issues. So, um, you know, I mean, there's a reason why he's probably had some difficulties. Um, but I wish him the best. I really yeah. do. I don't, you know, I, I'm, uh, I, th- I think he's just got a wonderful voice. And you know, when it's, yeah. when it, when it's working, it's, it's, a, it's a unique, magical voice. So, yes. uh, I, I so hope, too. I hope, I hope he has less problems. In the future. I like how he, I like his voice on "It's Another Day." I mean, it's, you know, it's. It tuned good. down, but it's it's it still sounds cool to me. I mean, yeah. like I think I think the focus is on John Bon Jovi's voice now. It, it is, it <laughs> is, Boy. and it's kind. Yeah. You know, I guess that's maybe that's my next question that kind of tags onto that. We do have our heroes, and and some of them are losing some of their range. But you know, if there's still a paying public out there that wants to pay to see these guys, even if they are a shell of of their former self. I mean, have at it. This is all these guys have done. It's it's what they know. It's it's who they are. I, I mean, you don't have to go to the show if it bothers you that much that they're not on top of their singing game. But um, I just, yeah, John Bon Jovi is a perfect example of a guy that's struggling right now. But like you yeah, said. I, I have, I've been hearing about this. I haven't actually watched any of it. Oh, oh it's well, you rough. Need to, you need it's to. rough. I, I've, I've heard that, um, yeah. which is unfortunate because I know 
we toured with John in the 90s. And I remember at that time talking with him about his singing. He was taking it very seriously. And he was, he would, after the show, he would go, you know, he would go in his dressing room and he'd warm down for at least a half an hour. Wow. He was taking it really, really seriously. You know, uh, that was several years ago. But um, so, I mean, I, once again, I hope, I hope he doesn't have problems. I mean, you know, now there's a guy who doesn't have to worry about his next meal. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. Neither do um, his grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, neither do his grandchildren. Um, yeah. But I do. I, I hope. I hope because I know he's serious about what he does. So I sure. hope. I hope for his sake, it's it's getting better. You know, we um, recently, well, a couple of years ago, we've uh, got to open up for Dawkins, and actually, I opened up for with you uh, back in years ago. I think it might have been in oh. two thousand. But uh, you came to Tulsa, and it was all the original lineup. And um, I got to meet you backstage, and I, I was probably pretty drunk back then. But, <laughs> but uh, I remember you offered me like the the food, and it was you know, a lot of vegetarian food. Um, and I guess a bunch of my band members, we just started scruffing all that stuff down. Oh, jeez. But um, there's a place called. That's the what we used to do when we would open up for people. We'd go steal their food. <laughs> yeah, man. gotta eat. But um, yeah. it, you know, it brings me. We when we talked to Mick, um, back then, and he he seemed like he was in high spirits. But it wasn't long after that he decided to uh, retire, and and I guess he just kind of told Don he was done and, and ready to, ready to go back home and just kind of got tired of getting you know catching flights and going to these shows all the time um what did you feel when you when you heard the news that he was uh you know no longer wanting to play well i wasn't totally shocked um you know he we you know we you know he had played on the first m machine record and so you know and we'd had a lot of contact um and he uh I mean, I could, I, I could tell he was tired and he was, he was physically hurting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, their, and their touring schedule was not easy. It was just physically grueling. Um, and so I wasn't shocked. And every time I've talked to Mick since then, he's been in the best mood and he looks great. I, I saw him not that long ago and he looked great. So obviously it was the right move for him. You know, I mean, at a certain point, if you're not enjoying the process and you can get out, get out. And that's, and that's right. what he's done. And he's living a wonderful life. So just got a text from him a little while ago, actually. He's, he's, he's in a great place. And he has a little brother that could step right in and fill his shoes. Huh? Yeah. He plays so much like him and sings so much like him. It's scary. Wow. <laughs> there, there's a picture of you guys right there. So what's going on with the end machine these days? Are you guys active right now? Well, not at the moment. Um, you know, it's, with these project bands um you know you kind of you kind of get a little period there you know you work together and you do it and then everybody has to go on to their 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 day gig or whatever um so i i don't know the progress of the m machine i mean hopefully we'll do another record in the next year or two sure. um i mean i would love it if we could start touring some of these things but touring is so difficult yes. and expensive and hard to pull off so so you know i'm we'll see uh, i would love it if you know, even if only one of the bands that I have, the M Machine, Black Swan, Heavy Hitters, whatever, anybody w was out there touring, um, it would be great. But, you know, it's probably a ways away. So we'll just kind of have to buy it our time. Right. Can you share some of your favorite memories from the Hearing Aid uh, project that you were part of in 1986? Dude, for, that was so cool for 15 year old kids like Scott. Yeah, and I. That was the coolest. That was thing. our We Are the World. That was our <laughs> version of it. And that's well, what they intended. Yeah. Okay. First of all, you had you know Michael uh, oh, Michael McKeon was there as you know right. in his spinal tap out. Lenny. Yes, and he was you know the whole day he was in character, and he was just cracking us up the whole day. That's the part that sticks out the most in my mind because he was just on fire the whole time being wow. you know a spinal tap guy, and it was wow. just. It was like getting an additional Spinal Tap movie of your own. <laughs> right. Wow. But he was great. Um, I remember uh, Kevin DeBro was being a real ham that day. And oh, wanted absolutely. To be yeah. Center of attention all day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I remember everybody else was really cool. I also remember uh, there was a gigantic party at Kevin DeBro's house afterwards, <laughs> and it was it was one of those all-nighter type deals lasted for five days 
And and all I know is the next morning, and it was at sunlight. At su- I don't even remember how we got there, but Mick Brown and Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister and I ended up at some hotel room together singing Beatles songs at about eight in the morning. <laughs> wow, <laughs> jeez, that's cool. But it was a it was it was that was so much fun. What a neat period of life, man! That yeah. must have been exciting. For you me. know, we are the Tulsa Music Stream. We would like to you know bring back some of like the memories of when you played here. And I know you just recently with Foreigner, you've played at River Spirit uh, yeah. Casino uh, not just recently. And, and I caught the the other one before that. And it was an amazing show. You put on, you have so much energy. And, and you know, when I played bass and, you know, I, I wanted to move like you. And, uh-huh. and now it's like, it's getting tougher to move like you, <laughs> and, you know. So he's a singer. So, so he's yeah. just a singer now, right? Definitely older than you. So. <laughs> and, and, and it's amazing watching you still bang it out, and, and just you're all over the place. But you know, those were so two. That's two you know shows. you're getting old because they say you're still banging. It out. That's right. 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 And so, that, well, so I you mean, have listen, those. And thank then, you. Then, I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. No, I'm, so, I'm, you got to take care of yourself to do that. That's for basically. sure. Uh, I, I don't know how it's so amazing, you know, with, with neck issues and back issues, but, um, also you came here with Aerosmith. Yeah. That was on the permanent vacation tour. Mm-hmm. And I believe that was, um, what album was that? It wasn't under lock and yeah, key. It was under, no, it was no, back, no, it was back, back for the attack. Back, back, back for right. the attack. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Which is a great album, too, in my opinion. So many tears. I mean, so many, there's really good songs on that album. Absolutely. Well, thank you. That's yeah, actually yeah. my favorite I thought that album. was an underdog, too. I always thought So Many Tears was... Oh, that's one of my favorite of, Dawkins songs. To me, that's kind of the quintessential Dawkins song. It's got... A, it's, it's heavy, and the melody and lyrics are nothing you would ever think to put on that music unless you're Don Dawkins. So I, I, I thought that was one of, one of his his better melodies and um and i remember george and i working on the music on that for a long time it was that that was that was one of my favorite tunes as well as the uh, the walk away um i don't know that wasn't on the album it's a beautiful song i can't remember it was in a movie or something right a movie album or something soundtrack no it was on the live oh that's yeah okay that was a great song that was a really good song thank you yeah i I was very proud of that song too i um Go ahead. Anyway, go ahead. No, no, I. Oh, sorry. I just I wanted to. I know you get asked this a million times, and I'm I'm. It's probably been asked a million different ways. But let's talk a little bit about your involvement with the movie Rockstar. Um, not only were you a character in the movie, but again, you were the musical director for that. Did you feel was there a a bigger sense of pressure uh, as being under that role f- for that kind of a movie with those, you know, with that star power, would you say the the pressure level was comparative to producing an album or was this like on a different scale for you pressure wise? Yeah, it was kind of different. Um, because number one, when you're dealing with a movie, you are dealing with a million people's opinions. It is mm-hmm. rule by committee at all levels. And, that's also very tiring and and explains why there's so many shitty movies out there right <laughs> right because because watching it watching the process is like wow i'm amazed anything gets made but we had a great director he was really great and he really knew how to keep us all focused and so consequently i think i felt less pressure because the director was so good at making it make it all feel like it was moving forward the way it was supposed to be moving Mm -hmm. so it didn't feel like there was a you know some like pressure was building like something was wrong and i had to fix it you know it didn't feel like that at all it felt it felt smooth i mean you know there was there was navigating the songs because you know zach was wanting to tune down to b and a and it was like we didn't really do that back then but ah fuck it it sounds great you know (laughs) Oh, man. So there was, there was those kind of things. But um, uh, so, yeah, there was pressure. I mean, because, you know, you do you have you have a lot of people, you know, on you, you know, um, George Clooney being one of them. Mm. Um, wow. But he was very, very, very nice. Mm. Really, really cool. Um, so so no, it wasn't it wasn't bad, but it was it was different. It was a different pressure. Yeah. Album pressure. Um, album pressure is so musically concentrated. Uh, this this was the pressure of music versus versus uh dialogue versus um you know 
commercialism, you know, all that stuff you had to take into account. So it, it is a different thing. Did you enjoy acting? I loved the moments of acting. The problem is, it's, you know, you sit in your trailer for four hours before right. you do the way five you... minutes of that, and then you go sit back for four hours. Jeez. So the pace of movie making, I'm not wild about. <laughs> but um, but I loved, I mean, I would love to try acting where I wasn't just playing myself because I was basically playing an 80s bass player. So, mm -hmm. um, but I would love to try doing something where I got to actually act. That would be mm -hmm. very cool. That's right. I, I want to ask you, bass player to bass player, because uh, I see you play a lot of Fender basses. I'm a I'm a Fender guy, but I play mostly jazz basses. I just got a, a my first P bass after all these years. But I see you, I see you play some pretty cool Fenders. Do you have? I mean, I'm sure you've amassed a, quite a cool collection. Do you have some pretty some pretty nice uh, ones that you do? You, and do you break out your best ones, or do you do you leave the best ones at home? Well, I I mean I, I do in the studio. I don't I don't bring them on the road with me. No. Um, on the road with Foreigner, I play a seventy three P bass, but I put sixty six pickups in it. Oh, that's just nice. I like them better. They're a little warmer. Um, and then my spares are all. I have a seventy one for a spare and a seventy three for a spare. So I stick kind of with that for. You know, so they're only fifty-year-old instruments that I play. Right, but still, man, um, I know, I know what I mean, those mean. <laughs> you want it? Do you want me to give you a little tour of some of those? Sure, of course. Okay, well, well, like let me start off no. with right behind you here, oh, which is my. Man. Okay, so I have a couple Thunderbirds too. There you go. Yeah, now you're a, talking. That's a sixty-three. Wow, it's in incredible condition. It's got all the. Um, I mean, it's got all the parts. I, I don't have them on right now, but it, it even has the pickup cover and the mutes and all wow, that other stuff. That's beautiful. Stuff I've man. never, ever seen. Hmm. And then you the recognize Hoffner. this. Oh, of course. I'm a, yeah. I'm a Beatles fanatic. Yeah, this was Paul McCartney's extra special spare bass that, oh. you know, he never he never even knew he had. Oh, wow. wow. I'm kidding. It's not his. It's mine. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's, just, it, that's it's, a real one. Makes a good um, story. Okay, there, there's my 70 jazz. Oh, that's nice. nice. That's very nice. I love that F, that F down there. Was it the ashtray? Yeah, they yeah, me too. Here's a 59P bass that oh, beautiful. Wow. don't use that often because I've got it set up to play with my fingers. So it's got mutes in it and stuff. And it's, okay. I just do that for like R&B stuff. Here is one of the first 100 Ampeg scroll basses wow. ever made. Wow. That's different. And yeah, I love that thing. Um, this right here is a. 58p bass you jeez see that? you are yeah. making me hard i'm sorry and, to say. Uh, it's actually it's kind of a mock one it was put together by danny gatton if you know who he was he was a famous guitar player who ended up killing himself but oh. he put together these really interesting instruments and that's just a fabulous bass wow uh, there's a 63p bass wow that, looks, Man. that looks like that looks really new yeah, i think this well, one could probably go on forever <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. It's going to go for a while. I'm going to, I'm going to end it with uh, these last two here. This is my baby. This is my 1950s. Oh, that is pretty. Baby. This is just the greatest rock bass on the planet. And wow. That's my baby. I would never take that on the road, but I've been playing that on records since mm. I'm their lock of tea. So, oh, wow. um, well, actually, and I probably didn't play this. I No, I bought it after on the lock and key, but it's definitely on back of the attack. Um and then this is the five string that I've been using the last few years. It's a Fender Five, love mm -hmm. it, love it, love it. Now back in the back in the day in the eighties, did you, you record with Fenders and then take some other brand out on the road? An eighties, an eighties brand. Yep. <laughs> Actually, um, tooth and nail, I did record with my Jackson bass. I, I was okay. playing. Yeah. Wow. Now. Um, We've got a viewer question. I have to ask this while we're talking bass. Uh, Kyle Jones says, ask Jeff where his squid eye bass is now. Ah, I sold that a few years ago. Somebody somebody wanted to buy that. And um, I forget who has it, but um, somebody's got it and they're taking good care of it. That's hmm. pretty cool. cool. And, and this is a, a, a live uh, stream. So we do have people in the chat room and they're... Um, sure. They, they're, we'll, and we'll get to some of those. I do have a, a, a question about uh back when you guys were on the monsters of rock tour and you know george recently not too long not too long ago he talked about how dispirited he was during you know during that time you guys were supposed to be up for a re renegotiation uh, for your con record contract and he felt like that was going to put them put you guys in the motley cruise and the aerosmith type you know area and then i guess a lot of things kind of he, he put it on Don of, um, 
you know, feeling differently about that. And, um, well, I, so I kind of wanted time, to hear your take about all that. <laughs> so, yeah, well, well, what I was saying is, is yeah, what George was dispirited mostly because Don had, had said he was going to leave the band. Uh -huh. Um, and so by the time we actually found that out on the, uh, Aerosmith tour, in fact, it was Halloween night. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. Halloween of 87 that Don said, yeah, I want to leave the band. We're like, what? Wow. We're opening for Aerosmith. Our record went to number one right. before. I mean, I'm sorry, went to uh, went platinum before Aerosmiths did on that wow. tour. Took us three weeks. Took them a month. Love rubbing that one in. <laughs> Heck um, yeah. But uh, but yeah. So I mean, we had the you know the world was our oyster, and and in fact, it was really odd because it even kind of felt like we were getting along on the Aerosmith tour. It, it, we you know we finally had it just a band bus we didn't it wasn't band and crew on one bus we had you know the crew had their own bus and we had a band bus and that was like a big deal and we started you know we would hang out together and we our road manager was rick sales who manages slayer and ghost now uh but he was he was you know not only our road manager but we were all really close friends so it was actually a really odd period that don decided he wanted to leave but i believe he he thought he could take the name and cash in and mm -hmm. get a deal with Geffen and do it that way. Um, and that made George very dispirited. Um, sure. Unfortunately, his reaction made Don even more sure that he wanted to leave. But mm -hmm. um, but it was it was real. I mean, it was it was kind of like he was very disillusioned. And I, I get that. You know, it was a it was an uh, it, it was it was a it was a sad time for us to break up. We were just kind of cutting through some of the real crap. I mean, mind you, during the making of Back for the Attack, it was very, you know, very separate, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so it did feel ugly then. But by the time we got to the Aerosmith tour, which is when we, when he actually announced that he was going to leave, by that time we were starting to get together and it was kind of coming together. So I, I've always thought that that was a very odd situation. I'm sure it was prompted by greed. So you guys um, probably came to Tulsa and he's already told you guys he's going to quit. And here I am, a 15-year-old kid going loving it. And man, little did I know, Don's fucking leaving the band. <laughs> fucking getting ready to disappoint me. That's a bummer. Yeah. Well, shit. <laughs> Just can you explain, because some of us fans, and a lot of us are diehard fans, and we've been listening to Doc and, and, and for years. And, and we, we're all caught up with all the drama and everything. And, you know, that's what all the news sites want to put out there. But, you know... We are out there in, in Key West, and, and here comes George, and he comes out, and he plays a couple songs with with uh, with Don's uh, version now, and, oh. and and so we see him out and about with you know playing with Don, getting on stage, but you know there's n no reunion, but there's kind of a reunion. They're fighting, but then he's on stage. <laughs> it's like, I, you know, I'm not understanding so much, mi so many mixed feelings about all of this. Is that normal behavior for the last 35 years? Well, I'm not sure what you're asking about. I mean, you're talking about they were fighting off stage or something? Is no, that no, no, no. It's like, so, you know, all the news sites put out all, you know, questions about the reunion and there's there's bitter and fighting. and But then you see him, you know, like get on stage and play songs oh, with, with yeah. Doc. And so it's like a lot of mixed uh, feelings or, I guess, mixed. Well, um, I mean. Right. I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty good gig. He just has to go up there and do a few songs with sure. him, so <laughs> it's kind of good. Um, I mean, George, n none of us are really opposed to a reunion right now. It's just that there's timing issues and there's right. um, scheduling issues and um, just all that. So, I mean, the fact that they're able to play together, well, hey, it's great. Yeah. You know? You know, what's weird is a lot of people don't know back in the day in the late 70s, like Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rose were the shit, but it, George Lynch was considered the number three guy, right? Right behind those two guys mm -hmm. back in the day. And uh, that's pretty cool. I, I, I'm a well, Randy Rhodes fan. in the late 70s, George would have even been ahead of Randy, to be yeah. honest with you, around L.A. at least, yeah. Wow. George was definitely the number two. I was living in San Francisco, and I heard about George, and this would have been like 81 or two. So, um yeah. I was told that there was this guy. This guy with really dark black hair. And of course when I met him, he had you know, he had the Kashagugu thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even actually put it together that it was George until years later because the guys that had told me about it 
were telling me about this guy, you know, with his dark black hair, that really great guitar player. He's like, he's like Eddie Van Halen, but he's even cooler. He's like, he's meaner and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, anyway, and I, I never put that together. That was George until later. But, but yeah, no, George, George, very well respected. What do you think about that Breaking the Chains video? I love it. Loves it. It oh, looks yeah. like it looks like a bunch of kids making. Isn't it funny? Video. It's funny when you look back at stuff like that. Didn't didn't didn't, didn't Jeff have too, like you know? a, a chain a chain on his base for like a strap or something? I did. Yeah. Oh, but that was comfortable. It was purple. I wonder, was it a was it a purple chain or I can't it was remember. Red. It was red. Right. Guys. Hey, let's. Yeah, it, we, you've been on with us almost an hour already. Thank you so much for your time. If, if you've got a few more minutes, we do want to get sure. to some viewer comments and questions. Sure. Uh, Lori Rotuno says, love you, Jeff. Saw you guys in Vegas, and you were so fun and energetic. Loving Black Swan stuff. Keep up the good work. So that is very cool. Now, I did see a question down here about uh, Black Swan. Yeah, this is from Kyle Jones. He says, will Black Swan ever tour? The songs are so great to not be heard live. Well, again, it's just the logistics of, of touring with bands like that is so, so difficult. I wish people understood how difficult it is. It's not as easy as you just stand up and play. Um, so will it tour? Well, we've had offers already and the offers keep getting better. Um, if there's ever a time situation uh, scheduling wise where you know the four of us could all do it, uh, the offer was right, I'm sure we'd love to do it. We would love to do it. And we always talk about it when we get together. Um, but I, you know, I don't like to lead people on. I don't want to let them think that there's some tour coming when there's not, because sure. um, it's it's something we'd love to do, but there's no concrete plans, and I don't know how soon that would ever happen. Right. Here's one more question from Cheryl Remington. She said, "I know that some bands disliked making videos. I wonder how Jeff felt about it. I remember for a video they had to use someone's girlfriend, which they didn't want to do." <laughs> um, well, I. Uh, Actually, I liked the video process. I mean, it was it was a little like a movie. There was a lot of sit around and wait, but at least it was all done in like a day or two or whatever. You know, movies go on forever. Um, but um, I did not mind making videos. Um, you know, I'm a ham at heart, so I love to you know I love to perform. So that was cool. Um, Do you have a favorite docking really, video? Oh, do, my favorite docking video is definitely it's not love, yeah. although. My memory of doing it was I was deathly ill at the time, and I we had just gotten back from Europe, and I'd I'd gotten a parasite, stomach parasite. Mm. Ouch! So they actually had to have a porta potty following the truck that was driving through LA. Oh wow! <laughs> so in between takes, I could you had run a special off. shitter. So <laughs> yeah! Wow! So that, that's a trip. That's crazy. But other than that, man, that that video was very special. Here's a um, one from Lori. Did you, Lori? Uh, Rotun Rotuno. I think I read that one already. Do oh. you see the one from uh, Joe Carbone where he says, "How is it to work with Robin McCauley?" Go for it. Oh, so great. Yeah, Robin is just the best. I mean, not only does he have a great voice, but he's a great writer and he's got a great attitude. And when we get together and collaborate, there's no ego between us. It's just whatever's better. And we and he's just and you know he'll take a beating you know some there's been times when it's like no still not right still not right still not right and he'll keep working at it he'll keep working at it um he is just one of the most i mean i remember when we were doing the msg record this was 1991 he would sing while we were doing the basic tracks for eight or nine hours every single day every single take wow i've never seen anybody except ronnie who worked that hard and um it was it's just incredible he's and he's a Dear friend, I mean, I was the best man at his wedding. I love Robin McCauley as a person, and I love his voice. I love his writing. I have nothing but amazing things to say about Robin, and that will always be the case. That's mm -hmm. very cool. I had that one album, with that, whatever album had "Give Me Your Love" on it. That was a pretty good. That was a pretty good album. Yeah, I think that might have been the Save Yourself record. I'm not, I'm not sure. sure. Well, here's here's one more question from Bill Scahill. He says, Jeff, how do you keep up your energy with all the bands you're you are in recording wise making music love all that you do well i suppose i mean i do have to really you know watch what i eat and make sure i get sleep and and all that kind of stuff how, how can you get sleep with all your corona. projects what's that how do you sleep with all your projects 
uh, short and, and I, I sleep briefly, but effectively. <laughs> um, no, you know, and, and, you know, I, I do my meditation. And in fact, you know, I do a, a weekly meditation class. Oh, wow. uh, if you go to yoga, hot for yoga, scv.com hot for yoga scv.com you can find out and and you can uh you can take my virtual meditation class that i i like to do once a week and wow. and that i think that's really helped especially during the pandemic all of that and i've been doing and at, at the same website you can do pilates as well and i've been doing pilates religiously since the pandemic twice a week and that's really helped wow that's very cool how come you didn't run off to the desert with george and bulk up we get all big and huge. <laughs> and then you know what you guys could have done? You could have put on some straps on your chest like man of war and stuff. And right. Could have been all these muscle this muscle band. Wow, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Getting me in a muscle band is not likely to ever happen. I'm that way too. I'm scrawny, dude. <laughs> they wouldn't want me. No, I hear you. You you mentioned briefly working with or well, you mentioned working with Ronnie. Um, what are maybe a couple of your favorite memories during your stints with Dio? Ah, just, I mean, really everything. I mean, working with Ronnie's great. I mean, he's, he was such a pro at every level, um, had such high standards and yet was so fun and easy to work with. We really collaborated great. He was just so, he, he loved, he loved it when other people got excited. And then when he got excited, he loved that whole exchange that happens when you're making music. He was so great about that. Um, and, and, and it was, and he was so efficient and professional and um, and just a great person. So, I mean, my memories, everything about my memories with him was great. So um, I, I think about him still an awful lot and I miss him an awful lot. We all do, we all do. Uh, Denise Dossing says, I saw The Foreigner Show a couple weeks ago, and I loved the music, of course. I just wanted to say that Jeff's energy was amazing, and watching his true passion and joy for playing slash entertaining was probably what I loved the most about the show. Mm. I'm glad I captured that in a photo. Oh, that's great. Ah, oh, great, great. Well, tell nice. her thank you. Super cool. Well, we're, we're going to start wrapping things up with you here. I do have one more quick question for you. Do you have in your mind how much longer you would try to do this, or do you just take this kind of a year at a time, see how you're feeling, and, and then go from there? I do not have a grand master plan, if that's what you're asking. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of taking – I mean, I figure my time with Foreigner will probably last as long as Kelly wants to sing, keep singing. Sure. Uh, and who knows how long that'll be. I mean, he still sounds and performs great. Oh, yeah, so, he's an amazing singer. Um, so, I mean, I, I, right now, the Foreigner situation is just so great. I mean, we have the band that we love. We have the crew that we love. We have management is great. Everybody, I mean, it's it's like we've really got it down to, uh, to a real great place right now. So, um, don't want to go anywhere on the foreigner camp. That's a, that's a real good place right now. Um, but uh, we'll see. I mean, you know, maybe my body will give out too. Cause you know, cause I don't want to be a guy, you know, I mean, I'm 64 now. Um, wow. See, I want to guess when that. I'm, when I'm, you know, when I'm 74, will I still be able to perform <laughs> like this? Probably not. Sure. Um, so, you know, kind of want to watch that too, because I don't, I don't want to be that old guy, you know, that goes out there and sucks. I just don't want to do that. Yeah. So, um, uh, and I don't need to do that. So uh, I'm fortunate and um, I'm just going to do it as long as I can at this level. You bet. You know, I think right now, if we can somehow get all the original members from Rat, get that, seal that deal with Rat, Warren, Steven, and then get Dokken, all you guys, and get you guys like a double headlining Ooh. tour with some, you know, good support acts to help out with that. I think that would be amazing. And that just would. do it in one big shot. He's like, all right, we're sick and tired of your guys' request for reunions. Here you go. You're going to get a double shot of it. And just boom. <laughs> there you go. You know, that's that's not a bad idea at all. <laughs> not at all. Do you, when that you would, see this. That would make, give it a reason for existing. Um, yeah. And you know, I think that. Pilsen would be the guy that could probably manage all that together yeah he's the Put, musical he, director he would be able to get all of that and get everyone's bullshit off to the side and say let's do this right well that would that would be cool um, i'm curious about this i'm curious when you see bands like motley Crue and poison and def leppard doing this arena tour do you do you think god damn it you know we you know a little bit 
yeah. a little a little bit of like we we blew a good thing you know our we let our greed and our our drug problems and everything else get in the way of what could have been a, a great situation uh, but you know you can't regret forever um you know i i i love my life so yeah. i mean sure. something, yeah, every something has to. been right um but uh but yeah i mean you can't help but think well, we, you know we could have we could have been uh, more on that level than than where we are and that's like i say strictly because of stupid human failures you yeah. know well the good news is that music and and those videos live on and those of us that loved it and grew up with it and it helped mold us as musicians it will always mean the world to us despite the dysfunction so yeah you definitely can hang your hat on that and certainly you've landed in a great place with with foreigner right and all of your multiple other projects that you're doing plus and, plus and, if he has kelly hansen cooking for him oh. you can't go wrong <laughs> That, too. that is that is really special, actually. Yeah, absolutely, he cook on the bus, and it's it's a whole lot better than anything we'd get oh, from catering. I'm sure, <laughs> sure. And, and and you're right. There is the music to look forward to. I mean, you know, the fact the the Black Swan record is out now. Um, George and I just did, and we're just finishing up another heavy hitters record, which is us doing cover songs, which is so much fun. Cool. Brian Tishy on drums. Bernard Fowler on vocals from the Rolling Stones and Corey Glover sings a song from Living Color. Wow. And it just came out killer. Awesome. Uh, I'm not sure when that's coming out. I think around Christmas because there's a, we actually, George and I actually wrote a Christmas song. Do you do, your rec <laughs> do, you do the recording there right there behind you? Yes. Awesome. That's so yeah, cool. I'll hear it. And yeah, the way you hear it, it's a, it's a, it's a really cool record. So we have those things to put out and look forward to and keep ourselves tied in to everybody. That's awesome. We will watch for it. Jeff Pilson, thank you so much for joining us tonight I, on Tulsa Music minute. Stream. We, we, didn't, we didn't hold a big tribute to Matt Lemieux yet. Let's do oh, it. Yeah, yes. Let's do it. Let's do that. Matt Lemieux, not only the greatest guy in the world, but has the original Sphinx from the Last in Line tour that Dio did in 84 and 85. That Sphinx resides with Matt. Wow. It is Our in kidding. Tulsa. That Sphinx is in Tulsa because of Matt Lemieux. So, and everybody should appreciate that. So it wow. sounds like Matt Lemieux needs to be our next guest then. Is that right? And you need to you need to have a tour of his, his museum because he's got this really cool little museum where he stores the Sphinx. Oh, okay, we're, Matt, we're going to need to come over, buddy. Matt Matt is the man. And, is, and he was a great guy. He's yes, just he great is. Guy. Yeah. Yeah, well, he definitely helped facilitate this. And his wife, Julie. Let's, let's not forget Julie. She's Hi, okay. Julie. Shout out to Matt and Julie. Jeff, thank you so much. We wish you guys well on the tour. It's it's going to uh, wind through uh, overseas and the States and take you guys through the fall. Aren't, aren't there, so, isn't there something with Kid Rock going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, in the summer. you guys. Yeah, we, we, start, we start, we do some, sh we start at the end of June. We do a couple shows with Kid Rock. And then I believe uh, then like the end of July, from the end of July till into September, we tour yeah. with him for a while. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, big, I think there's over 40 shows with Kid Rock. It's going to be great. Well, you guys be good and be safe out there, and we'll watch for you. Oh, do you got something? You know, Matt Lemieux says, I'm in Oklahoma City, not Tulsa. Ah. Ah. Right. Oh, right. no. That's Holy right. crap. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still we, coming over. Yeah. Yes. And yes. we do. This is, there is a chat room. If, if, if you feel uh, good tonight with your, uh, your zero beer you got going on. <laughs> If you want to go in the chat room and maybe answer some questions or hit like or whatever, you know, I'm sure that they would appreciate yeah. it. But there was a lot of people in here asking a lot of questions, and they are putting up a bunch of hearts right now. Give give Jeff Pilson some hearts, everybody. Absolutely. And oh, uh, they're all having fun. And, and um, it, I appreciate you coming on yes, here. Sir. You're a big yeah, thanks, idol Jeff. of ours, and, and we appreciate you. And you put out some great music, and you're a great singer, a great songwriter, great producer. And we appreciate okay. all your hard work and everything you do on that stage. Yep. Well, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. It was really fun. You bet. You have a great night. We'll see you out on the road. You will. Take, Take care. care, Jeff. See you, Jeff. Bye. -bye. Bye. Boom. Cool. That was awesome. That made me hungry for lasagna. <laughs> that made me want to go buy like five bases. I know. Oh, man, his base collection. Holy, Holy shit. Moses. Oh, yeah. Now, I imagine the food he probably gets cooked from Kelly Hansen because, you know, he's like kind of a chef <sighs> You know, oh, he, yeah. he was even on that what that show uh, that chef something when he actually won wow well I need Kelly Hansen to cook for me 
So we talked about Matt. Now, I just got to kind of know Matt. Now, Matt apparently saw our band at the IDL and uh, enjoyed it. And he's been watching the stream. I'm going to put a picture up of Matt because this is one of the coolest dudes that I've met in a while and, and well, spoken to on the phone. And I got to tell you, there's not many people out there that know stats and facts about rock stars the way that Matt does. And it, Matt, thank you for helping us. He not only helped coordinate this interview because he is friends with Jeff, but he also really helped us with the prep portion and just sent us a plethora of, of stats on Jeff. We didn't even scratch the surface on yeah. everything he sent. He's me. in the chat room right now. He but, says, uh, Julie and I love you, Jeff. Thanks uh, so much for all the years of friendship and this entertaining interview. Give, give Ravender and Olivia a hug for us. Yes. Well, we'll have to. I'll, I haven't met him yet but we're gonna have to meet soon and Man. We, yeah. could, we could probably talk for a lot of hours about well maybe we can all go have dinner yeah here here's his picture again thank you buddy you uh you know i i've had a long conversation with him on the phone and you know a lot of what we do it's honestly it really not just us but anything in life a lot of success is connections and and people hooking you up with this party or that party this was certainly one of those situations where um you know we've been working on booking guests and matt just happened to reach out and and offered this and we were like uh yeah of course we would love to talk to jeff and it worked out great thank you again matt so much and, and i do want to also give a shout out matt had I said, what can we do for you, my friend? And he said, well, I, I, I co-manage a, a young 26-year-old artist named John O'Neill. He's a Berkeley graduate. And that was one of uh, John's songs that we played leading into the show tonight. So we want to uh, give him props. And I guess he's going to go out and guitar tech for Anvil this summer, which is super wow. cool. So good luck to you, John, on that. And uh, again, thank you, Matt. Incredible. Let's so, give. So, go ahead, Scott. So, what were some of your favorite perf uh, shows that Doc and and or Forner? I don't know if you caught Forner him and Forner yet, but I know you've caught some shows. I've only seen him Forner on um, the the TV, the YouTube's. Oh. And uh, I've seen I, I saw him in Doc and a couple times there in the in the eighties, and I think once in the nineties, maybe. We're at we're at what shows? Do you remember all of them? <laughs> You're full of I'm it. just kidding. I told, I said at the beginning of the interview, I said I was at the Cabaret Theater with First Strike. Over. We weren't live at that moment. Oh, okay. Then I was at the Permanent Vacation Tour. Dude, and we're going to go back and do a review. Me and you, we're going to review. And so okay. the cab, I remember the Cabaret yeah, with, one with Rick Adams' band, First Strike. First Strike, wow. yeah. friend of ours, band opened up for for that show. And I remember Don was playing air drums. You know, he did that a yeah, lot. He did oh, do that yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. And George Lindsay picks like this. Yeah, I love his picking yeah. style. It's so unique. Yeah. So, so unique. yeah. They were very they were a very influential band for me, honestly. They totally. Were, yeah. I think the reason why they didn't get huge is cuz their music is kind of it's to me their music's a little bit deeper, a little bit more intelligent. I think it's those underlock and key outfits. We forgot to tell <laughs> them about you getting up and doing in you know my what? dreams. Scott, here's here's the deal. I want to. What's the deal? What's the dealio? The dealio. What's the dealio? It, it doesn't matter. It, I mean, it, it. Not to. Not to Jeff. I'm not downplaying the uh, the experience. He wasn't but there. He wasn't there, so he didn't get to share it. So I could have told him. And, yeah, and but he, he wrote the song. Oh, but we were there, and that's exactly. what matters. Well, you know. Well, I mean, it's okay. It's, yeah. It's all good. I. I just. Man, I just really appreciate. I cannot believe that we're getting to talk to our. You guys want to like plug this. a show or anything for this weekend? Um. I need to plug our sponsors real quick. All right. Let's do that. Right. So, uh, so th this Megadeth and Lamb of God show is going down tomorrow night. So, if you do, if you don't want to listen to the uh, the fine sounds of either Rocket Science or Mud Flux or some of the other locals that are grinding it out tomorrow night, you can go see Megadeth and Lamb of God at the BOK. Please do go support well, You can that just show. stop in at all three places. Yeah. Catch the first set of Megadeth and then... The oh, first wait, set of It Megadeth. doesn't work that way, does <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good, make, make sure you guys check that show out tomorrow night at the BOK. Also, Poison, Cinderella's Tom Kiefer, LA Guns will be at the BOK Center on August 20th. You can get tickets at BOKCenter.com for both of those. Keep an eye on DEB Concerts for more upcoming stuff. Shout out to Psychomo Filmworks. Appreciate our awesome show intro. If you have any uh, needs for video, Psych is your guy. Check him out. Thanks, Todd Cook, for an awesome online store. Why don't you guys go ahead and pick up 
a Tulsa Music Stream yes, shirt. Yes, please. Get Don, one. Don't just pick it up. Purchase Jeff, it. Jeff Pilson wears one when he sleeps. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah he does. It, when he flips that, that metal shirt, that metal show shirt around, it says Tulsa Music Stream on the back. It's I like, think he even bought an extra one to wipe down those beautiful bases of oh his. Oh, my God. No doubt. No doubt. Dustin Little, thank you for all your support of Tulsa Music Absolutely. Stream. Absolutely. Thank if you. If you have IT needs, he's your guy. Call 918-640-0892, Dustin at okiepc.com. Mm. We also appreciate gregshipman.com and Surviving Rock, Oklahoma for your contributions to our program. Teresa, you ready for some camera yeah, action? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get her on. I don't Boom. know. I don't know why she doesn't. She hey. she's got the, the you know the microphone and camera. She and, takes and her the phone. tickets at the she door. She should be. She's following all the questions and stuff. You know, because when you're asking questions and then I'm like going through them and I, I I'm like as I'm going through them you're already saying a question and then then I'll I'll start something you like already said that one. It's well, hard to interrupt the rock star. It is. So. It, it is. It's okay. It you got to split your brain. I, I keep track of it. I keep track of all yeah, of it. Yeah, well. Yeah. I do. I want to read this. She also takes the tickets for the, the crowd, and she also, she directs and produces. So, Doug Weber said, Doc, and open for Dio in 1984 was one of the best shows I ever oh, attended. And we didn't cool. ask him about when he played with Dio. Yes, I did. Yes, she did. I'm sorry. See, Where that's funny. Scott? See, remember he just told he just said I didn't say anything about I need to manage you. when I saw that. What was it like a like a two second question? Is Christy A there available? Watch, watch the replay. <laughs> yeah, I was probably reading something else down here. Watch, I am the Christy. Adair. It's okay. This really is tricky. You have to split your brain, Scott. I I feel your pain. Don't feel bad. It's okay. It's a very split brain operation. Thanks, Cynthia Shoemaker. She says we're doing a great job. Thank I'm gonna you. I'm gonna go with that. Let's I just think go so with too. That. So um, I think there's a lot of stuff like some meat and potatoes in this interview. I mean, he touched oh, yeah. on a lot of, a lot of. Were there carrots? Yeah, of course. Gravy. I mean, there was everything. I'm I mean, already hungry. We stopped. I mean, we talked about everything, and it was. I bet some of the questions were kind of hard to just you know kind of talk about. You know. Well, I mean, he he took them on. He did. He did. Yeah. He did it well. It was good. You you I've were fo- you right were forceful. You. you were forceful and firm, but. So were you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Who's playing where tomorrow? Go. I'm playing tomorrow at the Vanguard. Mudflux at the Vanguard with School of Rock and Shelter in Place. Cases. And uh, So stop there and after Megadeth's first set, as she said. Right. Scott, where are you playing tomorrow? Um, we are at Encore Tulsa, which is Broken Arrow 2. I don't know why that's that, but it's Broken Arrow and Tulsa. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's like it should be one or the other. I don't know. At some time, they drew a line in the sand. Ah, it's so, right on the line. It's on the border. Teresa, where are you playing tomorrow? All right, great. Okay. No, you're playing somewhere. <laughs> she's going to Megadeth. Cimarron. She's humming. She's got a hum set. No, you're going to Lenny's and Poster Child's playing there. Yeah. She's, I mean, she's doing an open house, open mic thing at the coffee house. She's okay. going to guitar tech for Anvil also. Yes. Right. right on. That's she's cool. going on the road with Anvil. Cool. Okay. Where, where are you playing? Me? Uh, <laughs> so we get two. We get two of them. Well, that's well, kind of unfair. I'm, I'm going to go Don Dawkin and announce that I'm quitting the band right here <laughs> live on air tonight. And you guys can go, oh, why? Things are going so great. No, I'm not quitting. I, I can't quit. Mm-hmm. I can't quit. Well. Hey, Bobby Cowdery says, Mudflex rocks. I totally agree. Totally Thanks, agree. man. And Matt Lemieux, yes, we'd be all about a part two. Hopefully we didn't scare Jeff off too bad tonight. We want to visit with you too, buddy. We want to we want to pick your brain. Yeah, for real. We want to trade real. information with you. For real. Hang out. I know. Well, so hey, it's Friday night. Yeah. You it ain't got no Friday. job. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is where we lose all the viewers, but this is some of the, some of the most entertaining stuff. Mm-hmm. If you'll just you ain't around. got no job. What are you gonna do? Bye, Felicia. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway. But you got my drink, honey. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go watch some more Ozark. Oh, oh, that's right. Yes. If, you, if you don't know that, Ozark's out. We have to go. Yeah, I got to eat lasagna oh, somewhere. Gotta go. I got to find right. lasagna. All right. Where am I going to find lasagna at 9, 10 at night? Not, at least like lasagna that's fresh. It's called Stouffer's and it's in the frozen section at Walmart. You stick it in your oven for like Don't we hour. have a staff that bakes us stuff when we're hungry? And Not like, unless these cats can cook. Matt Lemieux has given us an invite to come over. All right. Dude, we're getting in the car Anytime. right now. Right now. We're coming that way. All right. We'll do a live show from there. We'll yeah, do we a will. oh. We'll do a multi-camera. Don't tempt field me. Production. Don't tempt me, woman. All right, we're gonna get out of here. You guys got anything else? I don't. I'm good. good? 
Yeah. Um, I have a question. One more question oh, for Jeff. Shit. Maybe what? He can, can we call him? Get him back on real quick so Scott can get that done. He probably Wait. already asked it, but that's okay. <laughs> Ask him. Yeah. 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 Probably. No. I'm, I'm just joking. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm being a smart ass. We don't know when we're going to be back on the air, but we are well, going to be back on the air at some point. I don't know if that's good news for you or not. I can't crumple this up because it's got, got so many pages to it. Oh, you just, you know. Boom. Good job, y'all. Oh. Man, you all should try out for the Bulls. Oh. They need help. Oh. oh See you guys later. <laughs> we are Tulsa Music Stream. Thank you, guys. Subscribe sure. to our YouTube channel. Um, Follow us on Twitter, Twitch, and also hit the little bell, the little little icon, the little cool. bell icon where it gives the notifications when we go live and all that good stuff. It'll keep you guys updated when we go live, streaming, and you guys are automatically right there. And even if you're driving, he's right, you know. Boom. He's right. Right. So we appreciate you guys. And um, these interviews are fun, and we have a great time just cramming for these because we have day jobs, which sucks. And. and <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fuck yeah. And, 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 we, the power. and then we also play music. So, you know, cramming for these things. And the, the cool thing about a lot of these, these interviews is we know already a whole lot about these guys that we don't really need too much. You know, no, nah, we were docking fans. The only I thing mean. is like, we really needed to know, we know the past, but like future stuff or new stuff that just popped out stuff like news the news of putting out there like um you know foreigner did with their new album and just dropped it for us tonight the hundred thousand that they raised for the ukraine so so cool so cool are we matching that uh i have a hundred pennies okay sorry all right all, all right. right thanks anyway. you guys we are tulsa music stream we'll, we'll be see back you guys soon. next time matt start working on that next interview yeah yeah see ya. Good night, <laughs> love everybody. you guys good night <laughs>